So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have not already done so, please put in chat your name, your role. If you're from CDS, what your site is. If you're from an SAU, please put your school. We just really like to know who we're talking to. It just gives us a nice picture of how to shape our trainings moving forward. Um, as we go through, please feel free to ask any questions. We do have chat box check-ins throughout, and we're going to be keeping a close eye on that. But please feel free to interrupt us if that makes more sense for you to do so. This training is being recorded, and what will happen at the end of this, Julie will do her magic and we'll get this up on the website so that you'll be able to reference back to it when you, um, if you need to do that. So I've already asked you to do this. Please make sure that all of that information is in. And if your name is like, if you've joined through somebody else's link, if you could just change your name on your picture again, so that we just have a clear sense of who, who's here, that would be really great. So today I'm going to do my very best to talk about disciplinary removals and manifestation determination reviews. Um, Jennifer Gleason was going to present this for us, but she is um, unavailable this afternoon. So we're going to bumble through it as best as we can, and um, just we're we're going to we're going to be great. We're going to be great. So introductions is where we're going to start. Then we're going to talk about the federal regulations. We'll talk about disciplinary removals and informal removals, and then that manifestation determination process. So my name is Colette Sullivan. I am the federal programs coordinator with this team. Um, love this team, they're phenomenal. As I mentioned, Jennifer is not with us today. She's unavailable, but Carly, Ashley, and Julie are all here with us. So ladies, if you could just come on quickly and say hello, that would be really great. Hi everyone, I'm Carly Thibodeau and I joined the team just over a year ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Thanks, Carly. And I'm Ashley Satry, and I joined the team um, just this summer in July. And before that, I was a teacher here in here in Maine and in Virginia for 14 years. Thanks, Ashley. And Julie is here. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I have been with the DOE for about six and a half years now. And prior to that, I was admin support for 16 years at a K to five elementary school. Fantastic. Thank you, ladies. So we are all. Um... We, we've all been in education for a long time, and Carly, Ashley, and myself, as well as Jennifer, we were all special education teachers prior to joining the department. This is our contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. We try to maintain a pretty tight 24-hour turnaround in response to questions. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us if you if there's anything that we can support you with. And that QR code will just take you to our website, which just gives you a little bit more information about each one of us. We like to share in every one of our professional developments just some helpful resources. This is the link to the procedural manual, which is a very good resource. This you can see as evidenced there by that clip of the table of contents. It really contains so much information around the development of an IEP as well as just the regulations around what, you know, what that purpose would be, what the process should be. This is a great document. If you have not already downloaded it, I would suggest that you that you do. I think you'll be happy to do that. And then this is a link to the Maine Unified Special Education Regulations, or MUSER. And this is a less um, easy document to access, but it does contain all of the regulations from IDEA as well as MUSER. So this just really helps you understand why we do what we do and where the information comes from that sort of mandates what we do. So we like to share that as well. All right, so why are we here today? Why are we choosing to talk about this? So IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, provides federal funding through, through us to the SEAs, through those grants, and that's often referred to as local entitlement. And in order to receive your local entitlement funds, you need to be compliant with IDEA. So again, in terms of the regulatory expectations, this is 
All of this information comes right out of IDEA. One of the things that we are responsible for as a state is in February, we file through our data team what is called the State Performance Plan Annual Performance Report, the SPPAPR. And that needs to be filed with OSEP, which is the Office of Special Ed Programs. And we are responsible for 17 federal indicators and the data around those indicators. So for example, B13 is one of those indicators, that's transition planning. B11 is one of those indicators, that's child time. But we as a team are responsible for filing this data, which goes to Congress so that there's a, there's a report card, if you will, that speaks to how well the state is doing. And of course, the, that data comes directly from each one of you. So two of the indicators that um, can be really tricky are, are 4A and 4B. So indicator four takes a look at suspension and expulsion for more than 10 days for special education students compared to the state's rate. And 4A looks at the percent of LEAs with significant discrepancy, and 4B looks at significant discrepancy by race and ethnicity. So we as a team really had to take a look at what does IDEA say and how are we looking at this? What is our process around this and what does that mean for the field? So we look at suspension and expulsions greater than 10 days for children with, for children with disabilities. And the district must have a minimum of 10 students with IEPs enrolled. And then if there's a district that exceeds that N size of 10, what we do is we look at students suspended or expelled over 10 days must be greater than one. And that rate over 10 days must be more than three standard deviations above the state's rate. So I don't, you know, you don't need to know this. It's just, we just like to sometimes give you some of the background so that you understand that we're not just, that, that this really comes right from federal regulations. So this is just an example of how this might look. So you can see for 4A and 4B, so students with IEPs in District A there, 15, those who are removed and how that works out in terms of the data that we have to report against the state itself, the state data. So if we are alerted to an SAU, if an SAU is flagged by the data team and they let us know, then what we are responsible for as a team is to investigate. Why did this happen? And the way that we do that is we look at all of the documentation around the process. So the number of the incidents, were there meetings held? Was there conversation around all of these pieces? And did you follow policies, procedures, and regulations? And if not, we would issue a finding of non-compliance as part of or alongside your CAP. When we're looking at this, one of the things that's really important to remember is that if a child's behavior impedes their learning or the learning of others, that the IEP team really must consider the use of positive behavioral interventions, what are the supports that you have in place to support this student. So we're also really looking to make sure that there are some steps in place as evidenced on the IEP and the written notice to make sure that you are working really hard to support the student prior to any suspension or expulsion. Because you really wanna remember that children with disabilities are entitled to the same disciplinary protections as students without a disability. So I'm guessing if there's anything in chat, Carly and or Ashley will let us know, but does anybody have any questions so far? That was really mostly the regulatory stuff, just to give you a sense of where we, where we start from. Nothing? Okay. There's nothing in chat, so I think right. we're- Oh, phew, big sigh of relief, all right. All right, so. Disciplinary removals, let's talk about what that means. So Muser outlines what disciplinary removals look like and each state does that as well. And we have to, when we look at our state regulations, we have to make sure that they align 
with IDEA, with that federal law. However, state regs could go above and beyond the scope of IDEA if we choose to do that. So for example, like child fine for us is a little different than IDEA. We go above and beyond, but it's important to know that we have to start that bottom line sort of is what IDEA mandates. So let's take a look at this. So Muser outlines, and the citation is right there if you wanna go into Muser and look at it specifically, that a child who viola violates the code of conduct may be removed from their current placement for not more than 10 consecutive school days to an appropriate interim alternate educational setting, another setting or suspension. This may be additional removal of not more than 10 days in the same school for separate incidents. So when we're talking about separate incidents as well, you wanna think about whether or not they're substantially similar behaviors. And we can, we can talk more about that as we move through this. So if the child has been removed from their current placement for 10 school days in the same school, in the same year rather, I'm sorry, the services must be provided during any subsequent days of removal. And you wanna take a look at your education services because you wanna make sure that the child has the opportunity to continue participating in the gen ed curriculum as well as any services that they need to continue progressing towards their IEP goals. So you would really want to, all of the IEP team members would need to work together to talk about what does this child need to continue to have this access and work towards their IEP goals. If the SAU provides services to all children who've been removed for 10 school days or less, then those exact services must also be provided to a child with a disability. So if it's offered for all, you need to offer the same for students with a disability. So how, how would you calculate the days, right? So um, if, the if the removal is for more than 10 consecutive school days or the child has been subjected to a series of removals that constitute a pattern. So think about that pattern piece and that can be tricky, but you as an IEP team would really have to take a look at what are those behaviors that are involved in this process and are they do they constitute a pattern? Because a series of removals that total more than 10 school days in a year, because the child's behavior is substantially similar to their behavior in previous incidents that resulted in a series of removals, and because such additional factors such as the length of each removal, the total amount of time, and the proximity of removals to one another. You need to think about all of those things. So when you think about what constitutes a pattern? That really is up to the district officials to decide, really should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And like, for example, if you have um, assault and then you have arguing, do those, do those constitute a pattern? Well, you would need to take a look at the student. You would need to take a look at case-by-case -case to try to figure out if in fact that's the case. Cases that appear similar might be bullying and assault or a bus disruption and a classroom disruption, those types of things. So really trying to think about um, what constitutes a pattern of similar behavior. So that change in placement, there's the link to, the, to Muser, that citation. But on the date on which this decision is made, to make a removal that constitutes a change of placement for the child with a disability, the SAU must notify the parents of that decision and provide the parents with their procedural safeguards. And of course, you would wanna make sure that you document all of this very clearly so that again, when we, when we, if we have to come in and look at your process, we can identify that these pieces were done, that these steps were followed. So there are special circumstances. So a student may be removed to an interim alternative setting for not more than 45 school days without regard for the manifestation determination if they bring a weapon to school or they possess a weapon at school, on school premises or at a school function. 
if they knowingly possess or use illegal drugs or sell or solicit the sale of a controlled substance while at school, on school premises or at a school function, or if they've inflicted serious bodily injury upon another person while at school, on the premises or at a school function. So those are the three biggies that if that is, if that presents itself, that's a special circumstance. You would look at that differently. So Muser um, um, IDEA defines serious bodily injury. So that is an injury, bodily injury that involves a substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, protracted and obvious disfigurement or protracted loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ or mental faculty. So again, this is this is out of IDEA and this this is pretty hardcore. So this needs to stay put. And then they also define IDEA also defines dangerous weapon as such a weapon device, instrument, material, substance, animate or inanimate that is used for or readily capable of causing death, serious bodily injury as defined above there, except that the term does not include a pocket knife with a blade of less than two and a half inches in length. And why that is singled out in such a way, I do not know, I could not tell you, but that is how this is identified in IDEA. So those informal removals, we get a lot of questions about those quote unquote informal re removals. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those. So OSEP issued a, a Q and A that spoke very specifically to the needs of children with disabilities around those disciplinary provisions. And what this really talks about is when a child's school day is reduced solely by personnel rather than their IEP team in response to the child's behavior. So this document really answers more of these very specific questions around this piece. Also talks about how this calculation of 10 school days is addressed. So this could include exclusions that take place outside of IDEA's discipline provisions, which occur because of a child's behavior. So this would be like if a school administrator makes those decisions and they work that out, but shorten school days because of behavioral issues, or if a child with a disability is not allowed to attend because of behavioral concerns. So this document, this OSEP document is, is an important one to sort of go into a little bit more detail. So these types of actions, so that unilateral decision is made, for example, these types of actions would generally be considered disciplinary removals unless all three of these factors are met. So making sure, again, that the child is afforded that opportunity to continue to participate in their gen ed curriculum. Do they have that access in place? Are they still able to receive their services, those services that are identified on their IEP and make progress towards those goals? And is the child allowed the opportunity to continue to participate with their non-disabled peers to the extent that they would have been able to do had they maintained in that same placement? So that manifestation determination review piece, this is the big part. So, it's really important to think about who that team would include if you have a manifestation determination review. So you would wanna make sure that you have a district representative, the parent, members of the, the child's team. And it really just makes sense to involve the entire team as much as possible, just because you wanna make sure that you're getting as much information and you're really getting everybody's perspective on this. You could invite the child if you wanted to, it is not required but sometimes that perspective could also be helpful. It might give you some insight into why the child behaved the way they do. Regulations, however, indicate that the team must review relevant information such as the IEP, teacher's observations, and then any relevant info that the parent might bring to the table. You really wanna make sure that the parent has some, some input. 
But what you want to think about is within 10 days of removal, that results in a change of placement for that student. And you want to make sure, again, that you're reviewing all of that information and talking about what is the relationship to the child's disability? Or was it more a result of failure by the SAU to implement the IEP? That's a really big piece. So for example, if the child has a behavior plan on their IEP and the SAU is not following the behavior plan with integrity, then that could be viewed as a failure to implement the IEP, correct? So you wanna think about those pieces. If it is a direct failure to implement the IEP, then the SAU is responsible to really immediately take steps to fix that. So you would wanna, again, have a conversation with who, you know, why is this behavior plan not being followed? Does it need to be amended? If it needs to be amended, let's do that. Let's, let's amend it. Is the, do we need to complete an FBA? Does, you know, it, it, is it not being followed with integrity because people don't understand it? All right, let's do some training around it. So really being able to identify why the IEP isn't being followed and then work to correct that. So you wanna make sure that the child's IEP is accessible to the teacher, which of course includes all of the regular ed uh, personnel who come in contact with with that child. And I know when I was teaching, for those students of mine who were engaged in mainstream activities, and I had quite a few, I would share the IEP with them with special emphasis on accommodations, right? So if I had a student who needed a break card, I wanted every every teacher that came in contact with that student to understand why they the student might be trying to exchange a break card with you, right? Because if they didn't honor that, that could lead to some behaviors. And for many of my students, that was part of their plan that was documented on accommodations. So you wanna make sure that the, the individuals who come in contact with your students know this and understand this. Um, and also you wanna make sure that everybody who comes in contact with a student really understands what their responsibilities are around the implementation of the IEP. What do the accommodations say? What, you know, what exactly do you need to do for the student if they do this? So really understanding how to support the student in the best ways possible. If it's not determined to be a manifestation, then education services to enable the child to continue to participate. The child must receive as appropriate an FBA, functional behavior assessment, a behavioral intervention, some services or modifications around that piece. And you'd wanna make sure that these truly are designed to address that behavior. What is the behavior that, um, caught, that, caught, that led you here? And did it have a direct and substantial relationship to the child's disability? You wanna make sure that you're programming to address that. So if it's determined to be a manifestation, you must conduct that FBA. You must implement a, a BIP, must implement a behavior plan. If an FBA was already conducted prior to this change of placement and there is a behavior plan, you must really review it. Make sure, again, like I mentioned earlier, that everybody is implementing it with fidelity, that people understand it, and that it really is... Um, impacting the behavior in the way that it is intended to. And if it's not, you must really get in there and take a look at it, modify it if necessary. Um, you know, just really take a look at how this plan was put together, what the FBA says, and um, change it if you need to. If you've done that, then the child must be returned to the placement from which they were removed, unless the parent and SAU agree to a change of placement. So again, this is that very important IEP team conversation. Get everybody together and talk these pieces through. Document it very carefully. That written notice piece. You'll hear us say that a lot. We, we, you know, we talked about abbreviated day. If it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen. It's the same thing with this process. And for us, as I mentioned, if we come in to review, we are looking at the process. We are not there to say, you know, um, 
you know, we're not there to agree or disagree with where you landed necessarily. We are there to make sure that you follow the regulatory expectations. And one really important thing to do around that would be to very clearly document in the written notice. Yes, the child had an FBA and no, it was not being implemented with integrity. So what we did was we did training with all the staff. You know, we changed up the data sheet so they were easier to ma manage. You know, whatever the steps were that you took, we would like to see that very clearly documented here in your written notice. So I am an incredibly visual learner. Too many words on a page overwhelm me. Visuals work for me. So this was a visual that Jennifer Gleason put together that really walks you through all of the information that we just talked about. So you can see right up at the top, the student was removed for 10 cumulative days. Is it a change of placement? Yes, so therefore you need to follow those procedures or no, then you go to, you go that direction. So this, were I still teaching and were I in um, the, the position of having to manage this, I probably would print this and have it right in a place where I could look at it because I think it's a nice way to sort of represent those steps very clearly. All right, Colette, we have a couple of questions that have come up in chat. All right. Do you, can you see them or do you want me to read them? Let me find them. Okay. Got them, thank you. Good. I'm not sharing, so I can do that. Okay. Uh, Karen, hi, Karen. How does this apply to CDS kids in public pre-K? Can schools choose to have kids attend a shortened school day without CDS involvement, regular meetings, and without child having to resume full day with Within so many school days, a child is not ready for full day. FBI required for preschool kids too. Um, Karen, the 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 public pre K piece. We are working with uh, Roberta Lucas and um, Jack, uh, Jackie Hersom to get some clarity around how this applies to kids in public pre K. So I'm going to have to um, pause on that one and get back to you. But what we'll do is when we send out the contact hours with the PowerPoint and everything, we will we will include an answer to this one in that in that message. Can you verify who can do the FBA? In our northern rural area, BCBA is not available and looking for online options, I have not found one. So um, school psychologists can certainly do an FBA um, if you don't have access to a BCBA. Um, that would be a that would be a good place to start. And then if you don't have access to a school psychologist, I would I would talk to your team and try to figure try to figure that piece out. Um, it does not have to be a BCBA. Jessica, what percent of MDs determined that behavior was a manifestation or failure to implement the IEP? What percent? I'm not sure I understand the question. What percent of manifestations determined? So in the so, data that gets reported to you about oh. determinations, like how often is the IP saying, like team saying, oh, it's because we didn't implement that they're like admitting fault, I guess, or that if it is a manifestation. That would be, well, the man, if we would have to, all that is reported to us are the numbers of suspension and expulsion. So it would be up to us as a team to see if you went through that manifestation determination process. So that manifestation determination process isn't reported to us. That's what we would go on site and look at your information to try to determine. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. So if it, let's say it was reported like across the state, there were a hundred manifestation determinations just for like the statewide, you wouldn't know like X percentage were manifestations or okay. No, no, I don't get that. I don't get that level of information. What happens is the data team would report to me um, data around those those federal indicators that 4A and 4B, and if it if, if it falls outside of the state percentage, then we would have to follow up. So that's all that's all we get. We don't get anything specific to manifestation determinations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. All right, so the same IDEA document 
So if you have a parent and they disagree, the, the child has a disability and the parent disagrees with the LEA's decision regarding the change in placement or the determination about whether or not the child's conduct was or was not a manifestation, then they can appeal that decision. They can request a hearing, they can file due process. And if that is the decision that happens, then that would go, that wouldn't go through us, that would go through the due process office and they would work with the parents and the LEA to really uh, walk through that, walk through that step, walk through that process. So if the child is not a special education student, so if the child who has not been determined to be eligible, um, you would wanna be thinking about, did the public agency have knowledge that the child had a disability? So did the parents expressing concern? I'm really, I'm really worried about my student, you know, my child because. Uh, did they request an evaluation? Did somebody else, uh, a teacher, another personnel express the specific concerns? about a pattern of behavior. So you'd wanna be really aware of that if that has happened. So the exceptions would be if the SAU, the LEA made a recommendation to do evaluations and the parent said no, okay? They said no, so, so that's an exception. If they the child was found eligible but the parents refused services or if the child was evaluated and not eligible. For, for services as a child with a disability. So those would be three exceptions you'd wanna keep in mind as well. If evaluation is requested while the student is removed, you must conduct that eval within an expedited manner because again, you're going to wanna get this information to, to be able to move forward. But that child would remain in that placement that was determined by the school. So this could include suspension or expulsion without educational services at that point. But again, you're not going to want to just sit on this. You're, you're going to need to do that eval in a way that really is as quick as you can to get that information. And then if the child, you complete those evals and the child is determined to be a child with a disability, then you must provide special ed and related services per MUSER, the way MUSER outlines it. Uh, questions? Nothing new in chat, I don't think. Let me look. No, I haven't nope. seen anything new in chat. Right. I actually have another question. Would you rather I rate it? No, whatever works for you. So something that, that's come up before. So we have a student, if their, their disability of record is SLD, but the psychologist also diagnosed them with anxiety disorder, but that's not their eligibility category. Do you still have to do you still have to consider that diagnosis, even though it's not their, so, their disability of record? That's a really good question. So you would want to think about um, you would want to think about that. You would want to think about like what is the what is the is there a relationship between the behavior and the identification? And you as a team would have to talk that through um, and really make that, that decision. Um, if the child, um, so specific learning disability, so how would that impact and, and affect the child's behavior? You, you would wanna really think about that. Um, but yes, I would absolutely wanna consider other diagnoses. Yes, other disability categories. All right, at what point, at what point could the team make this decision without the parent? Oops. Meaning despite several attempts, the parent is not attending meetings or responding to the school. So that is a big one, right? You know, you do everything you can, you invite the parent, you reach out, you call, you email, and the parent just doesn't respond. I mean, this, this is a big one. I would really work very hard to get the parent there. And if you can't, you know, you're, you're going to have to make that, you're going to have to make that determination as an IEP team. But again, I would document, 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 document the number of times you've reached out to the parent, document whether or not they responded, you know, just documentation is going to be everything for this. Uh, following a manifest determination, school tries to get consent for FBA, multiple attempts, parent verbalizes they will sign but never do. 
What options other than documenting attempts does the school have? So again, if you recommend an eval and the parent refuses, you would need to document that. And if you, you know, you're not going to be able to move forward. You can't do an evaluation without parental consent unless you go to due process. But that, you know, it's, I wouldn't probably, I mean, again, as an IEP team, you're going to want to, you're going to want to figure out how far you want to go, what hill you want to die on. Um, but if the parent refuses consent for an eval, that, that kind of stops you in your track. Good questions. All right. We, I, I've said this a hundred times. I chuckle that we call this fun facts. We probably should come up with a new name because I don't know that anybody finds these fun necessarily other than us. But um, if you go to this link on our website, we have worked to pull regulatory expectations out of Muser and put them in a, um, like a one or sometimes a two page document. Uh, or a visual so that you can access this information without having to thumb through 300 pages of user. So you can look here, disciplinary removals is up on this link. So it is just, it's basically the information we just talked about, but it's in a condensed sort of easier to access format. So feel free to, to log on there and grab that. Our resources, we share these at every office hour. The first one is our PD calendar. That's where you can go right on and sign up for any office hours or our statewide trainings that we're gonna see in just a second. The second link will take you to those recordings for office hours we've already done or other trainings that have already been recorded as well as the corresponding PowerPoints. Resources, laws and regulations and forms and reported. Those are all on our OSI, our Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education webpage. So just a little bit more information for you if you want it. And this is our PD schedule. I think it's two pages. So it just tells you exactly, some of these obviously have passed, but it just tells you exactly what we have coming up, a little blurb about each one and the link so that you can register directly from this. And we like to share, um, obviously we just did discipline and manifestation determination. And we were, we were pushing this out to gen ed teachers as well, because as you know, this is not just a special education issue. Suspension and expulsion is not a special education issue. It is a school-wide, right? It is, it affects all students. So we were really hopeful that we had some gen ed teachers joining us to really be able to speak to this. On April, in April, we are going to do special ed law for gen ed teachers as well. Just because we've received a lot of feedback that, you know, we'd like to be able to just understand the law a little bit. So this is going to be, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we, I am thrilled that we have had so many related service providers joining us more and more lately. And these last two really relate to that, uh, writing measurable functional goals, avoiding outcomes and consultation and related service goals. So feel free to share these with people on your team if you think that they would be interested in participating. This is our professional feedback and contact hour form. Carly just dropped the link in chat as well. So you can access this either using the, the link or the QR code. And what will happen is it will take you to, where will this take you? Will it take you right to this office hour, Carly? Well, it'll take you to the form. You'll be asked a few questions to give us some feedback because as Colette mentioned, we really do appreciate the feedback. We pay attention to it. We try to adjust our professional development as much as we can um, based off of that feedback. And then you'll be asked to select today's training and just look for today's date. Uh, it'll say 10, 25, 23, and then the manifestation and determination office hours kind of thing. So you'll look for that for today's training. Enter your email and you'll get a contact our certificate sent to you. Thank you. And as Carly said, we, we appreciate your feedback. I'm in and out of this document all the time. And we have made lots of changes to our professional development based on uh, feedback that we've received from the field. So we, if there's something specific, please let us know. Here's our contact information again. Uh, when Carly sends out that information, we will include that the answer to Karen's question so that we have that. 
And, uh, but it, you know, moving forward, if there's anything else you get off the call and you're like, oh, I wanted to ask this, or I have a question about that, please feel free to reach out to any of us. One thing that we do offer to the field is the opportunity to get feedback from us on, you know, variety of topics. So for example, if you're in the middle of writing an IEP or you're trying to fill out an eligibility form, or if you've got questions about this topic in particular, feel free to reach out to us. If you're looking for feedback on something specific, like a goal or present level or an eligibility form, something like that, what we would ask you to do is to make it very generic, send it to us in an email that does not contain any child specific information and that is not on a form. Just kind of keep it hypothetical because we are mandated by OSEP that if it comes to us on an IEP, for example, and we see an error, that we have to ask you to correct it. And then we have to look for what's called systemic correction moving forward. So if you want feedback on something particular, keep it somewhat broad. And we are happy to do that because we want you to be successful as well. Anything else I can help you with before we let you go? No? Well, I appreciate you all being patient with me as I fumbled through this a little bit. Um, like I said, there are lots of topics that I can talk all day about. This is not one of them. So um, I appreciate it. So feel free to reach out. Let us know what you need. And thanks for joining us. Thank you, Eric.